last scramble. Hi, good afternoon. Um, welcome to New America. I'm uh, Mark Schmidt. I run the political reform program here at, uh, at New America, and it's really uh, a huge honor to have you all as part of this event uh, to discuss and celebrate uh, the new book, Civic Power, by Sabil Rahman and, um, and Holly Russon Gilman, who are who have been uh, integral partners of our of our work over over many years. Holly is a is a fellow in the political reform program. Sabil is the uh, president and CEO of Demos. Uh, but before that, among other things, he was a New America fellow and worked with our program. And this book is is many years in the making, um, in their lives both here and. Uh, and, and in their academic careers before that. So um, really, I think the magnitude of this book, I've been he kind of hearing about it for years. We've, these are the first copies. Uh, I, think, I think yesterday was the first time anybody's actually seen a copy of it. So you're all off the hook for not having read it yet. Um, although special prizes, if you have, figured out a way to read it. Um, but really, the, the, the scale of this book is, is, is really important, because I think there's a, there are a lot of discussions about civic engagement and, and participation that focus on either government's role in bringing people in or community organizing as a kind of adversarial activity um, or experiments in deliberative democracy and different kinds of uh, approaches. And what I think that uh, Holly and Sabeel's work in many ways kind of brings all those together into one conversation and looks at some of the, both the challenges and the new ways of doing work that, that uh, that can strengthen our democracy, and it, it, I, I, the the scope of the examples that they're using and the theory that they're bringing to it uh, is is really um, unprecedented to me. So we're just gonna they'll uh, talk about the book a little bit. I'll push them and challenge them a little bit, and then we'll open it up. I know from looking at the list that there are a lot of people in this room who I'm interested to hear your ideas too, and um, so we'll make sure we take some time for that and. Uh, and then try to wrap up in time to uh, to spend a little time together afterwards in the reception. So th again, thank you all for coming, and let me turn it over to our authors. Thank you, Mark. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. I'll, I'll kick us off and uh, toss to Holly in just a moment. But first, just an extra thank you to the Demos team, the New America team, for putting this together, uh, New America for having us in this amazing space. Uh, it's always nice to be back here in DC. and. Uh, and in the space here with, with old friends and meeting new friends who are here tonight. So uh, thank you all. Um, I want to open by just laying out a couple of kind of highlights uh, about what we're trying to get at with the book and where we are in this moment. And then you know, Holly and I will sort of ping pong back and forth, just lay out some of the more specific examples. But just if you, to zoom out for a second, right? I think when we first started working on this book, we were thinking about the crisis of democracy, but this is actually even well before the 16 election. And, and a lot of the concerns that we face now feel very sharp and magnified. Uh, but at one of the starting points for us in this project is that they were kind of here all along, right? That the crisis of democracy is not just a product of, <coughs> excuse me, it's not just a product of the 2016 election or the particular occupant of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, but it's really a deeper chronic and systemic one that has to do with how our larger civic infrastructure, democratic infrastructure, has eroded or been dismantled over time, right? and how political power has systematically been concentrated along lines, lines of race, along lines of uh, income level. Uh, and that's really a lot of what we're trying to unpack in the book. And so uh, a few kind of points to just start us off with. One, the first, just to uh, put on the table, we'll unpack this in a moment, is I think as we put this project together, we kind of realize that one of the big fights to fight here is actually within the democracy reform community writ large itself, that too much of what passes for democracy reform is not particularly <coughs> democratic, actually. And it's not especially good at empowering we the people, at building durable forms of voice in our communities, at actually transforming our political institutions in the way that they need to be transformed. So that's the first provocation. Uh, the second is that if we're serious about democracy and about power, what that actually means is that we have to look much more expansively beyond the sort of familiar list of democracy reform topics. So we actually don't spend very much time in the book talking about things like campaign finance reform 
for voting rights and uh, rights restoration, even though those are critical fights which we uh, kind of elsewhere in our other work and certainly in, in both of our day-to-day -day work are very much deeply involved in. But we really deliberately wanted to focus this book on the kind of larger ecosystem of what it takes for a democracy to actually work. What's happening in communities on the ground that are trying to build the kind of durable organization needed to create real lasting civic power? What's happening within bureaucracies and cities and states where the actual business of governing happens and who is actually in the room and who actually has power to influence those decisions? So it's this whole range of stuff that often gets overlooked, I think, in our kind of more familiar conversations about democracy. So let me pause there and talk a little bit about some of the specific pieces and then I'll come back. That's to awesome. Well, just to echo, thank you all so much. It's so nice to see so many great experts we admire and friends and family. And big thank you to the Demos New America team and a big shout out to Mark and Elena for all their hard work. And I think, you know, we're really excited to have this be an interesting conversation with all of you because for us, this project is about how do we really elevate some of these ideas and make sure it's a value to all of the different communities. I think on a meta level, this is a de-siloing project across a few different silos. And I think one of those big silos is between sort of civil society organizing and government bureaucracy. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And you know, I think as Sabiel mentioned, part of what we realized in doing this project was way before Trump was even a thought. We were doing a lot of work on the ground with organizers and realizing that the sort of thin mobilization between elections was sort of problematic in terms of really building longer term civic voice and civic power. And so I think the question for us is, well, so what are some of the underlying hypotheses that you know, the traditional democracy reform or good government movement, where are they breaking down? So I'll share with you here in a nice, you know, <coughs> think tank setting, four of the hypotheses that we sort of go through in the book and sort of demonstrate why each of them have their own, you know, validity, but they're not getting to the whole picture. And part of what we do in the book is create sort of an infrastructure approach and offer an infrastructure theory of civic power that really connects new models of organizing with new forms of policymaking. So sort of in this good governance camp, one of the big theories is sort of the civility hypothesis, right? If we could all just be more civil to one another, we would fix our democracy. This is where you get sort of third party candidates or centrist candidates, okay? Another one is the transparency hypothesis. And a lot of us, uh, including myself, you know, we worked on open government and we believed sort of sharing more information, sunlight is the best disinfectant, and that would sort of solve some of the challenges of democracy. And there's a lot of, you know, things that are compelling there, whether it's, you know, open data or freedom of information, but there are limits. The third one is the rationality hypothesis, right? <laughs> there you go. Um, and I think, you know, I look at it in part sort of the right waged a really successful assault on government for a long time. And so the response was, okay, we're just going to make it really rational. We're going to show you how rational government is with evidence and with really rational decision making. And then you'll all be convinced. And sort of a final hypothesis is what we call the hijacking hypothesis, which is this idea that if we could get money out of politics, if we could fix the corruption, then things will go back to their normal democratic functioning, sort of the snapback quality of American democracy. And I think part of this project really thinks that, you know what, that's not going to be enough. There are systemic challenges to our democracy, systemic racism, systemic inequality. There are big problems from you know, climate change to urban housing that really require building more long-term durable power. So in the book, we sort of challenge that good governance ethos head on. And then we say, well, so what happens in its wake? And I think part of the book, the more we're sort of talking about it, and again, this is our first public book event, so we need all of your feedback if this sort of resonates and makes sense but is sort of thinking about a new model for the administrative state. You know, there was a reason the 20th century administrative state worked really well, this idea of sort of insulated technocratic expertise. And there were reasons for that. But the question is, you know, today, where we find ourselves, does that model work? And I think a challenge with that model is that it makes individuals feel powerless. It doesn't enable people to be agents in their communities. 
And yet there are people every day in their communities coming together and organizing around issues that really resonate with them. And so one of the sites we look at in the book is sort of urban power and what's happening in cities, but also how you connect the issues that really affect people, such as public housing and affordable housing, with broader issues like data governance and who owns your information. And that's some of the work that one of the groups, the Partnership for Working Families, is really thinking about in our book. And so how you sort of take these new models and think about building more long-term durable power, and then how you work to create those models inside governance. And we look a lot on the local level, because that's where a lot of the innovations are occurring in the US. And we think about you know, how can we have more collaborative models of governance? How can we have co-creation? And really put pressure, create hooks and levers to those inside City Hall so that they're held accountable and they find ways to engage people and engage their communities. And so we look at a lot of new offices and policies that are happening in cities and think about where are there opportunities for sort of embedding them inside City Hall and scaling them. Great. So uh, a couple of other examples to add. <clears throat> so if you think about what Holly just walked through, these sort of the, these four hypotheses of kind of conventional democracy reform. You know, it's not that they have nothing to offer for the idea of democracy, but, it, but it's a really thin idea of democracy. And so compare two models of uh, governance, of policy making. One is, you know, your familiar town hall style mode of civic <laughs> engagement. Government is making a policy. We put out a notice and comment or we have a town hall. We've now gathered public input and then we're good to go. Now, setting aside for a moment this kind of parks and rec uh, style of like what actually happens in a town hall, think about what that way of doing policy actually right. looks like in practice. It's who is going to be most likely to show up, whose voices are most likely to be heard, uh, and it's, it's going to be wealthier and predominantly whiter communities that are able to do that. And then even if they're heard, the policymakers are ultimately not required to respond in any meaningful way, right? The notice and comment can be taken as an advisement, but it's not actually directly shaping the decision making. By contrast, some of the examples we lift up in the book are examples of really exciting, powerful organizers on the ground who, uh, like Holly was mentioning, where part of the, the ask, part of the thing that folks are campaigning for is actually a shift to how policy is made. So it's not just about giving input to the zoning board, it's actually having communities of color, working families, having a seat on the board that makes the decision about where the development goes in the first place. Or it's having those communities actually part of the enforcement and monitoring of wage standards or of um, uh, kind of public safety requirements. And these are kind of new models of direct community control where it's not just input to the decision maker but actually a share of governing power. The other example I want to put on the table, shifting now to the side of organizing and civic engagement, is that you know, we, especially after the 08 election uh, that gave rise to the Obama administration, there was a lot of interest and excitement, uh, which I did a lot of work on too going into this book, around uh, data and civic organizing. That you know, we've got these new platforms that allow us to quickly mobilize lots of people and get folks out uh, either onto the streets or into a campaign. And that's all fine and good, but there's a big difference between the sort of like flash in the pan, boom and bust, yes. cyclical turning out of folks, and the actual building of long-term muscle on the ground that empowers people to push for their views and push for their ideas in between elections and in a sustained way. And so in the book, we talk about some of the contrasting examples. For example, we talk about how uh, kind of new models of labor organizing, at, you know, both in traditional labor unions, but in, in sort of alt labor's uh, forms of worker organizing that have tried to build more of sustained power among workers. We talk about uh, in the book some examples of uh, groups that are operating at the city level or even in the rural level where the focus is less on individual issues and more on building that s infrastructure that allows communities to have voice and have power over the long haul. Uh, and you know, we can talk more about uh, both of those examples uh, or any of those examples in a moment, but I think the bottom line for us is that whether it's in policy making or in kind of traditional civic engagement, that con con conventional notion of thin democracy, right? Consult folks in the town hall 
or just mobilize folks around an election, that that's an illusion. It's not real, what real democracy requires. And so to get to the level of transformative change, we actually need a much deeper investment in different institutions, different infrastructures. And if you want to say something. Yeah, and I think just the complement to that is thinking beyond sort of, you know, the elections on the policy front to mm -hmm. governance. And that's why we focus on governance as sort of the second part of this story of building civic power, that what happens on the ground and how policies are made and who is a part of that co-creation is really important. And it requires a fundamental shift in this sort of, you know, we're just delivering better services to you model. It requires we're going to be sort of working together with many more opportunities for feedback and engagement in sort of a, it's not just about this transactional relationship. It's really about building deeper levels of trust and communication while also making good on the promise of what I've been calling a public, public sector. <laughs> one, one last thing, Ed, and I'll, I know we should open it up. Um, we also, in the, in the closing parts of the book, we also actually talk a fair bit about the, the kind of different communities of practice that are involved in making this kind of democracy real. And uh, we can talk more about that in the Q&A, but just to uh, kind of put a, put a flag in the ground around that part of our punchline for the book is if we are serious about building power in the ways that we're talking about, that means that all the different communities that are involved in doing the day-to-day -day work of democracy, whether it's policymakers, whether it's funders, whether it's organizers, that we're actually going to have to all do our work a little bit differently, right? Policymakers have to approach the idea of policy not as being about getting the right answer, but actually as being about serving the right people. And organizing has to be not about that flash in the pan, getting you know, kind of folks out on the street, but actually building the deep relationships and uh, associations and organizations that can outlast any one election. And then for those of us in the think tank space or in the civic engagement space or in the funder space, that actually means we have to resource folks on the ground totally differently if we actually want this to, yeah. to happen in the real world. So maybe, maybe we'll and totally there. differently means means uh, <laughs> well, we can, it's a longer it's a, it's it's a longer conversation we can get into that but I think um, you know for example uh, when we're talking about organizing actually resourcing groups on the ground for the long term to do base building work to do power building work that isn't about a particular issue and isn't about a particular election when it comes to policy making it means actually changing who's who who occupies these different offices at, at the staff level and in the bureaucracy, not just in terms of electeds, changing the pipeline of where we recruit government uh, and government uh, officials from, what their orientation is, right, that it's not just about uh, kind of expertise from uh, the Kennedy School, but it's actually about, uh, you know, actually being from, from and responsive to and accountable to communities on the ground. And I think, you know, we could structure things any way we want, right? We just take for granted the way things are currently structured. But, you know, in our conclusion section, we talk about this sort of civic fellowship model, which is about could we really be intentional with how we train people in a pipeline approach and offer rotational opportunities to be an organizer, to be in state and local government, to be in the philanthropic nonprofit sector. You know, we can invest in sort of leadership and think about really building a more inclusive, diverse pipeline and what this looks like in multiple stages and in multiple types of communities. I think multiple types of communities is kind of my question. Get I mean, in there, Mark. You know, I mean, it's easy to imagine the kind of co-governance you're, you're talking about as a Tacoma Park, <laughs> Brooklyn, Alameda County kind of thing. What's the, how, how does this look in a rural area, right. an area, or areas where you know, elected officials have kind of rigged a lot of things. I mean, there is right. something to the hijacking hypothesis, and part of the hi 100%. hijacking hypothesis is creating situations where elected officials, in particular, and then the people they appoint, are really isolated yeah. from lar from the feedback of large parts of their community by the way they've constructed districts or the way they're able to hoard money. Or I mean, a whole set of power relationships that have to be broken down first. Yeah. So, what are those different? you know, stories look like in different types of places. Yeah. You can jump into that. Yeah, I yeah, mean. Okay, great, great. I'm not sure I mean, we'll, 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 we'll open yeah. it up. I mean, I think that would be my only question, and then we'll open it up. So, so yeah, so just a, a, you know, a quick thought on that, too. It. I think one of, the, one of the starting points for us in the book, just to, like, so, so first, just to uh, 
name for a second, right? The idea of community control and civic participation evokes very different images depending on <laughs> where you sit, right? Um, and you know, I live in Brooklyn and from New York, and uh, one of the, the things I often think about is like, you know, the difference between, you know, is um, a community board hearing when the city is trying to build affordable housing is one experience of local democracy that is actually really problematic, right? Because yeah. that's a form of community engagement that actually serves to defend a set of elite interests or a set of an existing set of uh, economic inequalities when it's wealthier communities trying to squash the attempt to build yeah. new forms of housing uh, that are trying to dismantle some of the systemic forms of racial and economic inequality in the city. But to me, the, the, I think the difference would be that model of the community board versus an example of like what would it look like if the entire regional planning association or the entire uh, zoning commission for the city were in fact composed of a truly inclusive uh, set of voices from the city as a whole, where you have working people, black and brown people on that board with power, and that's going to look messy. It's not the it's not the idea of you get in a room and you have you know good, we have dialogue and we come to mutual understanding and then, and then you know, everybody gets along. I think our idea of democracy is actually pretty messy and <laughs> conflictual, but our point is that that's how it should be. And when we try to sterilize democracy of those types of disagreements, what we end up doing is just reinscribing some of the existing hierarchies of privilege and power. And what we actually need to do is to build into our democratic institution the, the full range of diversity and disagreement and back and forth so that we can actually hash it out and so that everyone is part of the fight. And I think, you know, when we talk about organizations in the book, the reason we talk about them is because they have infrastructure and power and we sort of take down a little bit the sort of um, idealized notion that technology was going to hyper-democratize the way people engage and, you know, the here comes everybody model and just this concept that, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom. Well, the challenge is, you know, as Sibyl mentioned, then the usual suspects show up. And so part of why we have this sort of marriage between civil society and governance is to your question of who shows up. So participatory budgeting, right? Where it's been most successful, you see this all across the globe, is where you have a strong civil society partner who is a genuine partner, not a lip service partner. And so in New York City, that's been community voices heard. You know, a grassroots organizing group that works with low-income women of color, primarily in public housing, and they've been able to say, this is a real thing, and it's only going to be real if we're really serious about engaging and empowering people. But they also then work with people inside the city council who says this is real dollars. This is real money that's being spent. And so when you come out, it's not just lip service. And I think that's where a partnership can enable people to really have voice and agency, but it takes both of those. Because if it's just lip service, people know. If the rules are rigged, they're not going to engage. And there has to be some credibility behind that. And that's why sort of the partnership is really powerful. So there are, there are places where you sort of need to engage with the rules before you even have the possibility of the kind of civic engagement that you're thinking about. Is that yeah. a fair? Uh, yes. So, so if I'm hearing, if I think I'm hearing you right, Mark, it's sort of like, uh, are you asking it's, that it's about sort of remaking the political rules of the game first to make possible some of what we're talking about? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think yeah. that, I think that, I mean, I, I fully appreciate yeah all the hypotheses that yeah. Holly laid out and, and, and like set aside, not yeah. rejected. But I think there are points where those, and, and, and it is a narrow view to say, oh, it's, all, it's just campaign finance. I mean, I spent sure. a lot of my life on campaign finance reform. I'm fully aware, I'm fully aware of its limits, <laughs> but there are structural and institutional, there are places where structures and institutions need to change before yeah. the kind of, uh, be, yeah. You know, people are kind of banging their heads against the wall if yeah. in, in a yeah. lot of, you know, in yeah. environment. There, you know, there are certain environments where it's like, come on in, and that's great. Right, but right. But that's, uh, that's not always the norm, you know. Yeah, and, and two things I would add to that. I think one is that um, I don't think these necessarily are like temporally sequenced, right? So when mm -hmm. we say we need to do other, some stuff before some other stuff, like, I think we should just be wary about that, right? Because I think it's, it's one thing to say that uh, 
say, campaign finance reform or any one of the policy recommendations we might have by itself is not enough. I think that's true. But that's different from saying that things have to go in a particular order. So I, I, I do think it's uh, notable right, that a lot of the groups that we talk about in the book, and in fact, you know, as, uh, uh, in my own day-to-day -day work now through, through our work at Demos, we do a lot of work with movement leaders on the ground, working in communities of color. And one thing that's really striking is that democracy reform doesn't happen in a sequence. Mm. It's for, for, for real communities and real people, all the issues are happening at the same time. Yeah. Right? The crisis of uh, uh, affordable housing and the crisis of mass incarceration and the crisis of climate justice are all happening simultaneous to the crisis of money and politics and the crisis of an unresponsive government. And that's actually where the power comes from, where the ideas like democracy reform become real. And I think we're, we're often used to thinking about them as a separate set of issues that has to come first, and that's more sort of technical. Like we have technical designs about is it going to be a six to one match or a seven to one match, and all that's important. But I think part of what we're doing is when you flip it around and start from the standpoint of people themselves who are not empowered and who need to be empowered in a real democracy, all the issues actually connect. Right. And that's where the energy for organizing comes from. And that's yeah. where, the, as we think about the gov how governance should look, we want democracy to be embedded in the housing authority, in the water utility, in uh, civilian oversight of the police. You know, that's, that's where democracy becomes real. So it's, it's, it's not a separate set of issues. Right. I mean, I think it, it implies that there's a kind of narrative around structural institutional reform where the story isn't just like, you fix these things. You fix these things, right. and you'll get you know single payer health care. Right, 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 you know, right, right. Let, yeah. Because government will just be different. It's, it's really a matter of saying these institutional structural reforms can totally change your experience of democracy right, yeah. in a, in your participation as a citizen. But that's a big story to tell. Yeah. That's a very big story. Let's open it up. I think uh, uh, I think we uh, raise your hand. I'll call on you, and then. Please wait for the microphone, and um, uh, Elena will bring the microphone. And just say your name and whatever your most relevant institutional affiliation is, if you can. <laughs> appreciate that. I think it's back row here. Yeah. Steve McConnell, the Citizens Participation Action Fund, also So uh, I get the, um, the part about participation, um, engaging people who historically sort of outside the system, making sure they're inside, the need for continuous funding so it's not transactional, it's transformative. Um, Demos has a set of uh, guidelines on what's independent political power, and we've yeah. been promoting that with communities. But isn't that really the process? It's not the end, right? I mean, where, is democracy the end result that we're looking for, or is it the just a way of getting to things that we want? And how do you talk about the kind of yeah. democracy is really a, a, a means to an yeah. end uh, yeah. and making sure we're focused on the end because there's probably lots right. of ways of getting there, right? right? So maybe democracy is useful in yeah. getting to some things and maybe not so useful to get to other things that we want. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, I appreciate the question. Also appreciate that Steve is on our board and for which we're grateful and um, uh, we've been partying for a long time. So. Um, I think it's both, right? And, and, and I'll jump in here, but I think part of what got us interested in this set of questions in the first place and what animates you know, so much of our work, both as individuals and in our institutional roles, right, is that democracy is both an end and a process. That we're, we're so used to thinking about them as separate things that it can be easy to say, okay, our end is uh, we want to solve the healthcare affordability crisis. And, that's a highly complicated issue. We need, so to get there, we actually need a certain way of doing policy that kind of pulls together expertise and, and so on. And then uh, pretty soon you start, you start looking at a process of doing stuff that is, that ha has certain features, right? That looks different. I think part of our uh, uh, starting point is that democracy is both critical to get to the end because without democracy, you're missing so many of the voices that are, that need to be part of the conversation, but it's also part of the practice of how we get to the end. And so it matters to us that we get there in a way that is about building long-term, inclusive, democratic voice, 
as opposed to just kind of cutting right to the to what we might think is the right answer uh, for the end, but may not actually be the right answer for everybody. Yeah, yeah. no, I agree with that. I think it's helpful. Um, uh, in the middle of the back row. Uh, Sam Berger, uh, Center for American Progress. Um, could you talk a little bit about the effect of uh, feedback loops here? One of the things that I think would be really interesting about this is when people approach something, they look around the table and they're like, oh, whoever's at this table is important because right. they're at this table. Right. And it was interesting, you know, Sibyl, you said, um, I think that this would be messy, right? That there are going to be not going to be a bunch of people getting in a room and just saying, kumbaya. Let's get out, and I think that's right at the beginning, but one of the ways that people exercise power is when they come in, everyone knows what they're gonna say, and everyone's <laughs> sort of like, yeah, we gotta go along with this, right? Like there's a reason, uh, like in the appropes fight right now, right. farmers need money, and everyone's like, okay, farmers are gonna get money, like what's the next thing we're gonna talk about, and there's not a big fight. And so, can you talk a little bit about how, if local communities have this representation, if they have a seat, if people have to keep coming to them, Every yeah. time they got to get a vote from them, or you can't do anything, um, how that may legitimate certain points of views that right now aren't legitimated, and how in fact that may lead to a less messy process over time as people sort of inculcate themselves and understand these viewpoints that right now they just don't have to deal with. I think it's a great point, and we have a lot of feedback experts here, so please jump in. Uh, I think it really requires, at least on the policy front, on the governance aspect, it requires opening up that aperture of who has a seat on the table, right? And so, you know, we've done a bunch of work here with Richmond's Office of Community Wealth Building, and they sort of said, you know, as we're making policy around poverty, why don't we have people who have experienced poverty serve and co-design the policy with us? And all of a sudden, that's who the policymakers have become accountable to, and that's where the feedback loop lies. The new urban mechanics in Boston, you know, they're one of these innovation units, but they're also really committed to on the ground organizing and getting that feedback. So when they're building affordable housing units, they did a design charrette and they wheeled out sort of a 360 square foot little unit and had people walk through it. And they did, you know, one on one interviews with people to understand what are their needs in their community. So suddenly, people inside City Hall are accountable to people all over Boston, not just the squeakiest wheel, not just the special interests. And I think over time, that's how you build the feedback loop. And I think you know, on the governance specifically, we have such a challenge of trust. We have such a deficit of trust and legitimacy in how people view the state for good reason, especially for extremely vulnerable populations. But then the opportunity is there to say that we need to be much more creative. So the New York Office of Public Engagement, right, when they're trying to get the word out, they're going door to door and they employ canvassers and field organizers and they go door to door to immigrants to say, here's what you're eligible to sign up for, here's your appointment, I'm gonna remind you when your appointment is and I'm gonna make sure you get the benefits you need and that's a new feedback mechanism and a new way that people can engage with the state. Now of course it takes a lot of time but I think, you know, we don't really have a choice, right? And if you talk to policymakers, they understand that this can help them do their job better and more effectively. Now, probably not more efficiently. And I think we just need to be honest about that. And we just need to talk about some of these tensions and some of these trade-offs and some of the ways it's gonna be messy. You know, I think time and time again, and when I'm sort of thinking about civic engagement, it is about process, and it's about investing in those processes, especially so that new voices can come to the table. But that's not gonna be such a simple, streamlined process, but ultimately, it can help create better feedback loops that are more representative of our democracy and kind of have a positive reinforcing cycle. Just to draw out, I think, an important draw. aspect <laughs> of, of, of what you're saying is that I think we sometimes draw that distinction between the sort of decision-making element of government, the legislative side of government, and the service delivery yeah. side. And I think one of the things that we've really begun to explore is the ways in which the service delivery side in people's everyday experience yeah. is actually part of their experience of democracy. So, you know, we had the event a year or so ago with Jamila Michener about yep. her book about the ways in which people's experience of Medicaid yeah. affects their citizenship and, of course, there's a lot of other literature, as Suzanne Mettler and so forth, about the what you know when people aren't aware of that when benefits are too subtle, um, right. that they don't 
kind of give people that engagement. I think too often the service delivery conversation doesn't focus on feedback to your question. There hasn't been, you know, the circle around, you know, you look at all the great work the Obama administration did, USDS, 18F, but then you talk to a veteran. We had a great, you know, USDS Department of Veteran Affairs. Does a veteran know that this was how their benefits got changed? So we haven't invested in the feedback and we haven't really opened up that process to people. And that has always felt like a really big missed opportunity to me. And just to, the, this, the service delivery aspect is, is important to kind of highlight, right? Because I think there's, there's there, are two versions of, there are two versions of the feedback story, right? And I think we're, uh, we're drawing on one to tell the other. Um, hmm. So one version of the feedback story is the thing that's missing is information about uh, about services or about communities, and if we get the information flowing, then we can get the policy right, and then we can serve people properly. Another version of the story is the thing that's missing, which sort of I think implicit in your in the way you framed the question, Sam, is, is that the thing that's missing isn't information, although it's that too. But the real thing that's missing is power, as in who do you have to yeah. cons who do you actually have to engage? Because without their engagement, you cannot proceed. Right, right? and those are two very different things. Right, and I think um, part of what uh, fascinated us in the book, we talk about this, as Holly mentioned, we talk about some of the uh, Obama era experiments with um, service delivery and user e interface kind of e experiments and uh, groups like the uh, New Urban Mechanics Group in Boston. Part of what's fascinating about the, those groups that we pulled out in, in our case studies in the book is that many of them actually started as like, we're gonna be, become more efficient by improving the flow of information, but what made it stick was that they actually became levers of power for the communities that were initially being reached out to in a service, in a service delivery mindset because, because of the, the sort of, um, the, the, the kind of center of gravity, uh, kind of uh, uh, accumulation of some gravitational po uh, political pull, right, that, that you were talking about. And so when, when Holly's talking about the, um, the difference between the kind of just efficiency and effectiveness, Right, I think for us, it's like set aside the efficiency point. We're much more interested in, you know, is this process of policymaking actually effective from the standpoint of inclusion and from the standpoint of who actually has voice? Great. Uh, Heather. Thanks. I'm Heather Hurlbert here at New America. And I'm so struck uh, last week sitting where you are sitting. Uh, one of our new fellows described um, the efforts of the Chinese government mm. to basically create service feedback loops that, in the view of the Chinese government, substitute for yeah. democracy. That you don't, Sounds that correct. their hope is you can satisfy your citizens as consumers yes. in a way that you don't need to satisfy them as, as democratic citizens. So, Sabil, you just made a comment about the moment where this kind of inclusion lever turns into a political power lever, and I'd love to hear you both generalize more from your cases about how that happens, you know, how the kind of customer service initiative turns into a building political power initiative. Yeah, that's, great. that's a great question. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, it's a great question, and so uh, two things I'd say to that. Um, one is that there's, part of this has to do with what this organizing infrastructure is independent of the state, right? Which is why a big part of our, uh, kind of half of the book is about sort of the, this idea of uh, an organizing infrastructure, right? That um, exists independent of government and independent of any one electoral cycle. That can be a base of political power and a way to project political power. Uh, the other side of the equation, I think, has to do with the, the governing institutions themselves. And so when Holly was talking a minute ago about uh, hooks and levers, part of what the metaphor is meant to conjure for us is this idea that um, you would actually want to, I think for us, we'd want to build into government actual points of literal leverage that, you know, whether we think of them as veto points or as gating points where they're actually folks from the communities affected who have us when we, you know, who are in government in some form, and so some, one of the examples that we use for um, is with the Community Reinvestment Act from uh, in the late '80s, early '80s, late '80s. That part of that, that was a part of the anti-redlining sort of set of policies that uh, 
the government had developed coming out of the Fair Housing Act. But there was an often overlooked piece of that policy, which was about who gets to trigger an, an, uh, an enforcement action against a bank. And there was a, a provision that allowed community groups to force an inspection. And like, not that many people knew about it, but where you had <laughs> groups on the ground that had enough capacity to be organized in their communities, they could then pull that lever as a way to force their, de their demands to be taken more seriously, both by banks and by the agency. Now, that lever was read out of the law by the courts. And we, that's another story which we can talk about. <laughs> um, but I think it goes to your question, Heather, that it's, it's, not, it's not just the policy blueprint, and it's not just the kind of organizing on the ground, but it's the combination of those two things that, can, that get you a bit further down the line of something that is actually power and not just sort of uh, a nice consultation because you know, the policymaker deigns to do so. That's a great question. And I think you know, one of the things we're going to have to really grapple with, I think, sort of as American democracy is sort of this idea, this, you know, the rationality hypothesis sort of taken to its limits, sort of is this what the role of the state is? Is it just to be providing really you know, great services like the private sector? You know, I think it's just a question that I think we really do need to think about and what that sort of hollowness is both from a democratic standpoint and also just from what I sort of say the mouthfeel. Like it just leaves people deeply unsatisfied, even if everything were equal, even if distribution were the same across communities, which it's definitely not. It's not a real way to make people feel empowered. So that's sort of just a very high level thing so you can think about that before you go to bed tonight. And then I think, I love what Sabil was saying about sort of where you see that countervailing pressure um, you know, externally in the hooks and levers. And I think in the book, what we also see internally, how there is that it really does require a sort of culture shift inside the bureaucracies on the ground. And there's a few ways that I think maybe all of us in this room, I don't know everyone, but that we can sort of create the, you know, sort of service champions of this work when you see it. And I think funders have a big role to play. I think you've seen funders put catalytic dollars and put you know, new kinds of people inside City Hall who really want to take experimentation and take new approaches. You know, the Boston New Urban Mechanics often cite themselves as the risk aggregators. So they can take the risks, and so other people across the government in agencies can be more open to experimentation. But I think how do we support and champion those people, right? That, I think, is a very big question. You know, Sibyl and I wrote a white paper at New America on rebuilding civic capacity. Many of you were there. And some of the groups have said, you know, you are the only people who have ever written about us. I use this when I go talk about the work I do. And I try to, you know, get funds and fundraise about it, right? I mean, those are the kinds of opportunities that I think that we have, but we need to do more to lift up those champions because to do this work beyond efficiency in incredibly resource-constrained environments requires dedication. When I talk about the participatory budgeting model where you're seeing people from the agencies working with their community members, that's on their volunteer time, right? And so when you asked their question earlier of sort of how do you change what this looks like, like how do we reward and really empower people who want to do this work and really want to empower the community, but if they themselves are not empowered and they're not compensated, what does it look like? Okay. Anne-Marie. So this question actually builds directly on the last one. Anne-Marie, and and we have a requirement to identify. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Anne-Marie Slaughter. We have only one rule here. Okay. <laughs> Anne-Marie Slaughter, CEO of New America and very, very proud of this book. It's, it's a wonderful book. And so this follows on the last question and, and maybe puts the courts in a different light. But So you've been talking about engagement and power and the way that can actually give people levers of power. But I want to ask about something considerably less, but that may still be important in a democracy. So when I was a law professor, I was very struck by research that showed that when you sent people, people in small claims court, hmm. uh, would go to mediation, and the mediator would say, you're gonna lose, right? This is your, your claim against the cleaners, they lost your, your jacket or whatever, and the, the mediator would say, you know, if, if you go before the judge, you're almost certain to lose, take a settlement, here it is. Right. And some number of people, a not insubstantial number, would say, I wanna go before the court anyway. And they would lose. But what they wanted was the opportunity to be heard. 
They wanted just to be seen and heard as a citizen, even knowing that they wouldn't have the power. So I, I wonder to what extent you see that. That's much less than what you've been talking about, but I do, I think it's important that a government say, I see you, I recognize you, I hear you, even if you're gonna lose. They don't have to go on Judge Judy to have that. <laughs> yeah, uh, well just to, to riff off of that, Emory, and, and um, I think an extra thank you, of course, for, for both of us, because so much of this project originated in early days when we were sort of roaming the halls around here. Um, uh, I, think that's, I think that's totally right and, right? So um, being heard and being seen and being visible is a big part of being an actual like co-equal member of the democracy. That's true, and that doesn't require you to win every fight. But it does require you to win enough that you are, in fact, seen and heard, right? Because <laughs> if you're nominally seen and heard, but you never win, are you really seen and heard? And so, um, but I think your, your example is a really good one because uh, I think that speaks to sort of like the, the bootstrapping that we have to do to get to kind of uh, uh, claw and chip our way towards a more inclusive democracy. So by that, what I mean is, um, you know, a lot of the examples in the book, we sometimes get pushed back about like, well, the, the vision of democracy is expansive, but the examples are very like micro, right? Like what's happening in Boston, what's happening in uh, New York City Hall, right? Um, and you know, this is something we, we get pushed on a lot, but I think part of it is that uh, this, there's so much ground we have to cover in terms of actually getting to a real democracy that it's not gonna happen wholesale and I think we feel like there's more um, upside, more like the ripple effects that are possible from some of these experiments and, and, and moments of transformation are, uh, are, have greater possibility, right, than I think they're often given credit for. And so this idea that, okay, even just being literally seen and heard can have a transformative effect in how uh, particularly marginalized communities feel about the democracy, that's really important. Then the next question would be, how do we build on that, channel that into a more sustained form of or get civic organization, of public pressure, of then gradual shift in how policymaking happens in round two and round three and round four. There's sort of a, you know, we're kind of bootstrapping our way towards a real democracy. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and Emery, thank you for all your leadership and inspiration and support of this project on every phase of it, including on the, the book blurb itself. So we are grateful and happy to be here. Uh, I, I think it's a great example because, you know, what, what we've seen, you know, time and time again is that people, if they feel like they can be a part of a process, are much more understanding if they don't get just what they wanted than I think public officials sometimes have tolerance for. And I think what I hear in that example is the civic leadership opportunity when you're going and you're presenting in front of the judge and making your case. And I think of one of the examples in the book, which is coworker.org, which is a platform to empower workers. And it is campaign agnostic, and it doesn't seek out <laughs> campaigns. People come to the platform, and they raise the issues that are important to them in their workplace, and Coworker works with them to sort of mobilize and find other people around the globe and really does a lot of that important transformative organizing on the ground. And they had had a lot of wins, Starbucks barista campaign on sort of the algorithmic scheduling and enabling people to wear tattoos, but they also have a lot of losses, right? And I think what that, what that model tells me is that different kinds of people can be leaders in different kinds of ways. And so when we talk about building civic infrastructure, part of that is enabling people to have a voice, to say the issues that really are impacting them. But I think as Sibyl is saying, so with, there's you know, the idea of the ladder of engagement. So here maybe it's the ladder of civic power. So it's moving towards something. So maybe you don't you know, have the case win or win your campaign, but you're building something. And that if we think of, I mean, a common theme throughout this conversation is how do you democratize these processes? If you're making these processes more democratic as you're simultaneously finding new entry points for engagement, <laughs> over time that builds civic power, even if in every individual instant you don't get the outcome you wanted. Of course, another aspect of this is aggregating those, like individual actions are less effective than collective action, right? And part of changing power is 
enabling diffuse interests to become organized interests. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that's an important, I mean, I was really struck today, I was trying to read every single aspect of Senator Warren's uh, political reform or anti-corruption plan. And all of a sudden in the middle of that is, you know, a ban on forced arbitration, which is not in the political, pro you know, that's not mm. a that's ordinary political process yeah. thing, but it's fundamental to people's ability that's to act together in, yeah. uh, in, in cases okay. like the small claims. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Calvin Harris. I'm just a run-of-the-mill Democratic strategist in D.C. Um, I do have a question uh, about your book, just in regards to um, the uh, current, you know, Democratic presidential primary. Um, I've heard you know, of that. Uh, obviously, uh, we understand. Um, you know, people want to feel as if they are part of the process. Folks want to feel as if they're heard, seen, and visible. But um, how can you do that in a way that moves beyond just being seen, heard, and visible as a voter? Like, um, I've worked on several campaigns across the South, and I would argue that, you know, as much work as we've, we've done to include folks in the electoral process to encourage them to get out and vote, as you look up and down many of the policy platforms, um, you know, across, uh, you know, the 20 some odd candidates, uh, I'd argue that there's very few that speak directly to uh, some of the low income black rural communities that um, you know, I've come to know pretty well. So um, you know, I'd love if you can just sort of speak on how to get from you know, sort of you know, changing the culture on the ground, you know, allowing people to be you know, sort of heard and feel visible to sort of you know, transforming to um, bringing their issues and concerns that keep them up tonight at night uh, to national debates. Um, thanks so much, Calvin. Uh, so one of, there's a, a short piece in the book where we talk a little bit about uh, organizing for America, uh, sort of, the, and that pivot point in 2008 going into 2009 when uh, the grassroots sort of energy that Obama tapped as a candidate and sort of built this right, this, you know, kind of as the as a story now goes, is sort of like uh, kind of wildfire of mobilization and excitement and energy. Uh, and then what happened after January 20th, right, 2009? And um, I'm, this being the room that it is, you know, I know for a fact there are folks here who have more direct experience in that <laughs> than, uh, than, than either of us do. But, you know, we, we mention it specifically in the book to get to your question, which is, um, one of the biggest losses uh, for, our, for this idea of civic infrastructure and civic power was actually the transferring of that OFA list yeah. to the DNC. Yeah. And the collapse down into a top-down, push-out messaging, fundraising machine, which actually cut off at the knees what was, yeah. in fact, evolving into a vehicle, a space for genuine bottom-up organizing and association. And and that just, I think, illustrates for us part of why we try really hard in the book to, to set aside and bracket the ele electoral and campaign uh, s piece of it, because so much of this turns on what's left after the election. 100%. Like when the storm of ad buys and money and you know, uh, uh, volunteer GOTV yep. people is gone, what civic infrastructure is left in, the, in those communities, right? And, um, that's a much better test, I think, for what you're talking about, because if you do it right, then it goes sort of to Sam's question earlier. Uh, if, we're, if we can actually organize in black and brown communities and, and invest in the people who are doing that work day in and day out, then you create a center of political power, a center of gravity that sort of forces future campaigns to come to them, right? As opposed to trying to like squeeze in, you know, shoehorn views into a, into a menu of choices that may or may not actually speak to what people need. I think it's a great question, Calvin. I, I love that answer. And the only thing I would add to that is, you know, I was on the ground as an organizer in 08, and I was, you know, there in the recession, seeing people who would literally get fired and then come that night and just like spend the night making phone calls with us. And that was our lives. And it was a huge community. And I remember the day we picked up. I mean, we had, I was in New Hampshire, we had like 50 offices and there was one left for OFA, right? So 
when you talk about your first question of what would that look like, when we talk about resources, that's a resource question of how you would staff and how you would really invest in communities in between elections. And I would love to see more of the candidates talk about governance in a realistic way. And there's so much energy and creativity and technology that goes into campaigns. How do you put that energy and creativity into governance? And I do think just sort of bringing it full circle when I talked about sort of the assault on the state that's happened uh, from the right in the last 30, 40 years, I think one response has been to you know, make government small and make the state invisible and say, we don't even need to worry about governance because like, we don't even do that. Like, the private sector does that. And like, well, that's not exactly right, right? And so if we had a more affirmative understanding, affirmative democracy agenda, I think it would really help to build that connective tissue in between elections so that when you go back to communities, they don't feel like you just knocked on their door and gave them nothing after two to four years, which is what so many communities feel like in this country. This is a great question. I've always, I, I have real doubts that yeah. that can come out of an election structure. Yeah. And the way it's structured now. Can turn yeah. into a non-election structure. But anyway, we have about 10 minutes left. I want to go quickly. This gentleman in the back row has had his hand up for a bit. Uh, my name is Mike Kolash. Uh, I've often had a question of whether or not an economic system which allows some people to accumulate great wealth and other people to have essentially not any of their needs met, whether you can ever have a true democracy in that type of social system. And that's what we're confronted with. You know, the people who make the money, they always feel they're better than the people that don't have it, so therefore they're entitled to more. And that keeps it clear been through 200 years of this stuff, and it seems we need to change the basic structure if we're going to make progress in equalizing things and having a real democracy. Yeah, maybe let's just get a few more questions on the table, then we can go. <laughs> well, I, mean, I, I promise to make them answer it. Elena, the, the uh, guy named me. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Tim from Cork. Okay, from Corker.org. Oh, yay! So for the well, shout please out. join. Yeah, please share it. anything. <laughs> I hope we did you justice. Yeah, no, no, that was great. I really appreciate it. You're modeling that lifting up experiments thing, so We're I trying. appreciate that. <laughs> um, my question is, like, in some experiments that I've observed that are, like, democratic in workplaces and on tech platforms, um, people are also able to organize and build power who have a very different agenda of white supremacy and transphobia mm. and misogyny. Um, so I'm curious, like, in experiments that you've seen, has, has that come up? And how have people baked in at the front end and, like, built a culture that's, like, this is a democratic experience that is explicitly anti-racist and how yeah. they, like, prevented that from forming as a problem? That's a great question. These are just, you know, small questions you two are asking. Okay, great. <laughs> Let's do one more, and then we'll make them, we'll make them answer it. Uh, Re Rebecca. Hi, I'm Rebecca Coakley from the Disability Justice Initiative at CAP. Um, my question is, having worked in the Presidential Personnel Office at the White House in the last administration, um, several of us have a peer support group where we actively talk about, okay, day one, what does it look like? And while I think it's going to be a total cluster, and we're going to have to go around with sandblasters to you know, pull down the, the gold spray paint on everything and whatever and it may end up looking like inside the building. I also think there's a huge opportunity to correct some real historic inequities yeah. um, that are inherent in our democracy. And how do, my question is, how do we, I mean, I, I almost could have gotten people our policy tattooed on my forehead. I said it so much during the eight years of the Obama administration. Mm. But how do we take this energy from the grassroots? How do we take this feedback this yep. um, from the bottom up and really institutionalize it in a meaningful way to create a better actual, like, tangible state going forward? What's the three questions? Yeah. Let's, um, oh, boy, the, the, just those the, three questions. The underlying economic inequality. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then the other two. <laughs> They're harder to sum up. <laughs> yeah, well, the, so the short answer is that no, we cannot have a democracy under conditions of deep economic inequality. It's very, I think it's a very, it's a great question. It's a, it's a, the, the one sentence version is easy. What, what that actually then implies though is like pretty dramatic, right? Um, and that democ actually building the kind of democracy we want is going to require pretty radical transformations to our e economy as well. And one of the things that um, 
is a through line in the book is that a lot of the examples are actually not, uh, there are examples of groups and policies and, and bureaucracies that are, that are working on structural economic issues and we're looking at how we democratize those policy making decisions, right? So why, it's a reason why we keep gravitating in the book to examples around things like housing or things like worker justice, where these are uh, efforts to dismantle long-term systemic economic inequalities through the building of grassroots power and through the transforming of our policy making you know, day to day. Uh, I think that connects a little bit to, to your question, Rebecca, about um, you know, what do you do on day one, right, or on, 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 uh, we're on day, day zero. Um, I'm so glad you, you brought that into the conversation because one of the things where, Holly mentioned earlier sort of the, about pipelines and, and so, like I think we're really, really interested, both of us, in just the human aspect of it, that it, it matters who's in the seat. And not just who's the elected official, but actually who's in the cabinet, who's in the sub-cabinet, who are the staffers, and what are the lived experiences that they're bringing yeah. to those roles. And on the, uh, in, the, in the kind of bureaucracy parts of the book, part of what we're trying to push against, I think, is, is the idea of like the craft of policymaking, that it's not actually just about traditional forms of expertise. It's that too, but it's much more critically about um, a wider notion of what counts as expertise, right? The lived experience that we want in the room is a different kind of expertise that we need to think about on the front end when we're sort of actually staffing uh, these bureaucracies. And then on the question of uh, anti-racism and organizing, um, it's, it's such a great question and uh, a much longer conversation, but um, you know, we talk a little bit in the book actually about how one of the preconditions for this crisis of democracy was in fact the, the sort of um, colonization of our information infrastructure and our media infrastructure. And, um, yes. It's not a coincidence yes. that we feel ourselves as uh, fighting uphill against a surge of really terrifying uh, and explicit forms of uh, racial exclusion and or and uh, uh, racialized organization, racist organization, and it's because it turns out that we have a media ecosystem that was basically optimized for that kind of organizing. And so, if you take this. Uh, if we turn our attention to the larger, uh, we keep using the word infrastructure in part for this reason, that there are all these other systems that need to be remade for a democracy to survive. And I think what you're pointing to about our media environment and our tech platforms is, is part of it. And so um, it's one of the reasons why I think both of us uh, are kind of pretty skeptical in the book about the kind of civic tech uh, 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 optimism of the pre-2016 era there are pieces of that we want to piggyback off of, right? And one of the things we, one of the reasons why we're so interested in your work, but um, uh, but it's it's not just like a silver bullet. Yeah, and I think I'll add to these two since we've addressed your question. We solved that problem. Um, I think you know it's a very hard challenge, and I'd love to hear at the reception sort of how you guys at Coworker are thinking about this. I mean, I think we just we can't minimize it, and we can't you know we can't gloss over it. I think it's a real challenge, and. I think you know Sabil's point is spot on about how do you democratize that media landscape when some of, you know a lot of the organizations that we've been talking to you know Center for Rural Strategies you know they're based in Appalachia and for them they're like we need to really have you know public control we need to really reinvigorate rural media because otherwise it can become cannibalized and you know hyperlocal podcasts that are occurring in communities I think there's going to, and there has been a lot of things happening on WhatsApp. Again, everything, you know, cuts every which way, but how can you sort of empower communities? I think one of the bright spots for me is where can you build more inclusive identities? You know, so when we look at something like Faith in Texas, where they're using the lens of faith to bring people to the table to have a new type of identity, you know, long term, how do we build bigger collective identities that get people out of some of these, you know, buckets of hate, but this is very hard long-term work. And it's, Rebecca, I, I, you know, I love your question, and I think you know, the, the resources, the relationships are really important, and I think that is something where we really could really democratize them and think much more in how you invest in young leaders, young leaders of color, how you really mentor people, how you sort of move people through different phases of their life and their career. That's one part of it. The second part is from the vantage point of the federal government, how you can really tap into communities in a way that really like harnesses their expertise 
one of the things I worked on was looking at community development block grants, which is federal dollars already devolved to communities. So many community provisions were in it. Could you use it for something like participatory budgeting? You know, the concept of the Green New Deal is very compelling insofar as we are going to have to have a hyper-local solution and involvement to an incredibly large systemic policy problem. However, when we have such low levels of trust, how can people trust that the government is going to be their ally and not do something harmful to them? And so that's another reason why having communities at the table is so important, because if they're not really part of a real process to empower them, there's no way that they're going to believe that these things are possible. And I think it's really going to take a combination of big, forward, bold policies to deal with challenges like inequality. And it's going to take real hands-on. Every community needs to be involved. I don't really see another choice. I guess that leaves a lot of questions on the table, but also ends us very eloquently. So I think we will <laughs> take this opportunity to move to the reception. I want to thank Sabil and Holly tremendously. Thank Honor you, the book. And thank all of you thank for you your engagement. <laughs>